Hello, I'm Dr. Balthazar, and God damn it, there are things in this world that are just obnoxious no matter what kind of perspective you try to take on them. It's like trying to be philosophical about a case of hemorrhoids. Case in point, Amazon Studios Rings of Power, who will be dropping season two sometime in the year of our Lord 2024. A show surpassed only by Netflix's need to blackface history is the most obnoxiously unpleasant hemorrhoid up the ass of digital streaming platforms today. Why my phone has decided to start peppering me about a show I deeply resent is anyone's guess. To my knowledge, it hasn't offered up any new news lately, but okay, whatever. I usually stick to movies and shows that I enjoy for these videos, and my digs are more tongue-in-cheek than hate-filled. I also prefer topics that won't be fucked with too much by thinly veiled censorship attempts masquerading as copyright claims, like Amazon Studios has proven they love to do. But on the other hand, I'm not analyzing this bullshit show, just offering a little advice on the back of some context. So maybe I can keep the rants within the bounds of reason. If you're sticking around, thanks for your time. Like, subscribe, future content. But anyway, the Rings of Power are an expensive investment that has been a commercial failure for Amazon. And while superficially impressive in its style elements like cinematography and CGI application, any meaningful story elements are just polishing up a turd. And that's before we consider the show as a Lord of the Rings IP rather than just a fantasy series. You get measured with a different ruler when you use someone else's IP there, boys. So how do we turn that frown upside down for Tolkien fans and make a coin or two for Amazon Studios out of this project in Season 2? Let's talk it through. But first, a little background. John Ronald Rail Tolkien published The Hobbit, or There and Back Again, in 1937, and followed that charming little children's tale with his grand fantasy epic trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, in 1954 and 1955, nearly 20 years later. In 1977, another 20 years or so on down the line, he published the book The Silmarillion, no mean feat since he died in 1973, four years prior. His son Christopher Tolkien, with some editing help from an author named Guy Gavriel Kay, assembled the Silmarillion, which isn't a narrative, but rather a collection of notes one would use as the framework to organize the writing of a narrative. The History of the Middle Earth series followed between 1983 and 1996, which are more annotated notes by J.R.R. Tolkien compiled by his son. These books reveal the work of a man endlessly making changes to the world of Middle Earth and its inhabitants. So the first and second ages of Tolkien's world were never something the author himself felt like he had nailed down in a final format that was done for posterity. All this is to say the idea of a strict canon for the people and events of the First and Second Ages, predating The Hobbit, is a bit inaccurate, and lore nerds like myself should be taken with a grain of salt. Bind yourself to my will? Yes. Subscribe to my channel? Eh, maybe. Take everything I say as the absolute bottom line? Fuck no. Anyway, The Lord of the Rings has a strict canon to observe. The War of the Gems and all that followed have a flexible canon to respect, not necessarily a strict one to observe which I've said for longer than I care to remember, makes it perfect for something like a miniseries. You have source material and a storyline framework that doesn't pin a writer down to ultra-specific scenes, dialogue, and events, so they can inject a lot of their own vision into the plot, but still keep the Tolkien's world building. When word of Amazon getting to the Lord of the Rings business dropped, I hoped it would be the story of the First Age and the War of the Gems. The Silmarillion is not a good read. It's tough sledding. But it's great lore and a fantastic framework for stories that a competent writer can translate into narrative form. Like having a clearly mapped out set of destinations, one can use different routes and methods of travel to make their way through. When Amazon later said their series would be set in the second age, my reaction was, It was not what I wanted! But okay, fine. Less interesting than Feanor and Sons, The Sundering of the Elves, The Silmarils, Wars of Morgoth, and The Tragedy of Beleriand. But you can tell a story in the second age of a good amount of flexibility and how you go about it, and I won't pitch a fit. But there's a fuck ton of difference between having flexibility of characters and plot and making the bullshit transformations of every person, place, and thing as created by Tolkien into the absolute disgrace pandering to the so-called modern audience that emerged blinking and confused from the mud circa 2020. Now, to be fair, not all this is due to the professional incompetence, personal narcissism, and self-aggrandizing need to incorporate allegorical social politics by the dipshits that produced the show. You're a joke. You would have been a bond salesman somewhere. You're the brother-in-law they make jokes about. A lot of fundamental problems are tied up with the tangle of intellectual property rights related to the works of Tolkien. For books, the Tolkien estate and HarperCollins own the publishing rights. For movies, Warner Brothers New Line Cinema own the publishing rights. For merchandising, video games, board games, and basically anything other than books, movies, and shows, United Artists held the rights from 1968 to 1976, when they sold them on to the Saul Zaints Company, who in turn sold them to a holding company called Embracer in 2022. To make matters more complicated, WB New Line and Embracer's rights only extend to The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, not anything published posthumously by Christopher Tolkien, such as The Silmarillion, Unfinished Tales, Histories of Middle-Earth, and so on. Where Amazon comes into the field of plays in 2017, they purchased the rights to produce TV series on The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings of at least 8 episodes in size per season. If they want to sell merch on those shows, without permission, they cannot. 
If they want to spin off into a movie without permission, they cannot. If they want to publish books recounting the events of the shows they create without permission, they cannot. At least not without making separate deals with the groups that own the rights to those mediums. Where a lot of frustration with the Rings of Power comes into play is that Amazon didn't purchase the rights to the Silmarillion or any of the other literary works that describe events before The Hobbit. They only purchased the rights to The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So they can create an eight episode or longer television season set in the second age of Middle Earth, which seems to have been their intention from the start, use whatever characters and locations from Middle Earth that appear in The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings books to tell that story. But if it resembles anything that appears in the published works on the second age that isn't explicitly referenced in The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, or the appendix to The Return of the King, they will be sued for copyright infringement, and they will lose. This would be like purchasing the rights to the characters and locations of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, but not the story itself. So if you made a Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone movie as it appears in the book by J.K. Rowling, you would lose a copyright infringement case, because those were not the specific intellectual property rights that you purchased. Now, if you decided to move forward anyway, making your version of Harry Potter and a Source of Stone as an homage to the Country Bears Jamboree or something, with a non-binary Harry Potter, a Thai ladyboy playing Ron Weasley, LeBron James cast as Hermione, and change Hogwarts from a school into a submarine, you wouldn't be sued for copyright infringement, since you didn't tell the story from the book. But the reaction of Harry Potter fans will still be on you for being a fucking moron. Maybe, oh, I don't know. If you want to tell a story about Middle-earth in the Second Age, purchase the rights to the story of Middle-earth in the Second Age. Just a thought. I'd be curious as to the rationale behind the specific types of rights they acquired from the Tolkien estate, but I'll just infer the people at Amazon are fucking imbeciles until I'm presented with some meaningful evidence to the contrary. There is a certain irony to be appreciated in all this. The Rings of Power Season 1 successfully told a story set in the Second Age of Tolkien's Middle-earth when they did not have the rights to do so, and they weren't sued. That means if you remove the Lord of the Rings from the title and muted the name of any person or place in the show, you could re-release the Rings of Power as is, with no changes of any kind, and not be sued by the Tolkien estate for copyright infringement. It has that little to do with Tolkien's Middle Earth. Amazon couldn't tell Tolkien's story even if they wanted to. They didn't want to even if they could have. And the story they told made no attempt to respect Tolkien's characters, world building, or lore in any way whatsoever. So, why did they flip up $250 million for what amounted to window dressing in the form of some brand recognition in the show's title? Without the brand recognition, you could argue the viewership numbers would have been greatly reduced. But on the other side of the argument, viewership numbers can be modest, and a project still turn a profit if it isn't starting nine figures in the hole before production costs and advertising begin to accumulate, which for this show are reported at nearly $500 million for the first season. Amazon needs to earn back close to a billion dollars before they make one red cent of profit on this investment. As a streaming service, that would have to come with new subscribers to Amazon Prime, upgrades by existing subscribers to the new ad-free Amazon Prime, fuck you Amazon for bringing ads into your streaming service, by the way, or from advertising fees which are proportionally related to viewership numbers that have to be something special to earn back an investment of that size, before the close of this century anyway. All of which brings us to The Rings of Power Season 2, and my prescription for turning this dumpster fire around, you know, because I'm so smart. It even says I'm a doctor down there on the screen. Bitch, recognize. Truly, you have a dizzying intellect. So, we open Season 2 with a hazy recap of The Rings of Power Season 1, with all its craptastic highlights, whatever the fuck those are. Hugo Weaving as Elrond then wakes up and says to his wife, Fucking hell, I just had the stupidest dream ever. Assholes on a beach chanting the sea is always right. Gandalf dropping to earth in a meteor rather than arriving from the Undying Lands on a boat with Saruman, Radagast, Palando, and Alatar. Mordor created by jackass waterworks rather than by the Golden Lamp or Mal being knocked off the Tower of Ringgill by Melkor. And fucking Harfoot to whatever those worthless sacks of shit are. God damn. His wife, Celebrian, who's still around in the Second Age, says, yeah, that, that's some of the stupidest shit I've ever heard. No more Dorwinian wine during the work week for you. Maybe he asks her, hey, where's Galadriel? Out slaying ice trolls or something? To which his wife replies, ice trolls? The fuck are you talking about? My mom's in her room sewing. What, do you need to talk to my dad or something? Celeborn is kind of busy building the army in a region at the moment. Anyway, you bury the fucking Rings of Power Season 1 like the end of Super Mario Bros. 2, as a goddamn dream sequence. You then move on as quickly as you can with a hard reset to bridge into The Hobbit pretending the first season was just Amazon subverting audience expectations to save face. Okay, obviously I'm joking. But quitting while you're behind isn't the same as quitting, and if Amazon has five seasons, as it's rumored to have, to get this project profitable, they need to tabula rasa this motherfucker as soon as possible, and completely transform how people see their studio's approach to the Lord of the Rings intellectual property. I don't think it's going to be enough to say, well, we've shifted the tone in season two, taking it in some really great new directions, and we know it's just going to be really great, and you'll love it. What a bunch of bullshit! They should return to the bargaining table with the Tolkien estate and say, look, 
we're already in this thing for a fuck ton of money, but you've seen what we can do without a lot of structure when it comes to telling a story. We know how to fill complex diversity quotas and exploit them to gaslight critics and fans, and figured that we'd be plenty good enough. But lo and behold, everyone shrugged off the diversity thing in about five minutes, while the horseshit story and characters had them leaving in droves. There's now people on this planet that associate The Lord of the Rings with our show, rather than your grandfather's books. Let that sink in for a moment. If we shot a porno on the graves of J.R.R. and Christopher Tolkien, it would have been more dignified and respectful than what we did with The Rings of Power. Their corpses wouldn't have rolled over in the graves as many times as they did. We don't want to lose money, and you don't want to watch us disgrace the works of your family's forebears any more than we already have. Extend our rights to the first and second ages of Middle Earth without taking us back to the bank, and we'll find creative ways to fill our diversity quotas without fucking with the lore of Tolkien any more than we already have. Amazon can then start fresh in the first age with a new attitude of humility and respect for the source material. New writers, new cast, new everything. Rebranded with a new title creating distance from the rings of power and telling a story as closely aligned to the framework and lore of the Silmarillion as possible. Theoretically, this might recoup what they've sank into this disaster since the fans of Tolkien's world will engage with a sincere presentation of Tolkien's world in the same way the fans of Frank Herbert's Dune have engaged with HBO's presentation of that IP and viewers won't piece out to the tune of a 63% drop from season premiere to finale, like they did with the first Rings of Power season, when they found out they weren't watching anything related to Tolkien's work, or done with enough basic competence to be an adequate stand-in for Tolkien's work. And while I'm using my three wishes, I'd also like to win the Powerball jackpot and look like I'm 25 years old again. The chances of Amazon unfucking this thing are zero. Although I've never taken issue with being wrong in the past, and they did a good job of turning around, uh... A fucking nothing. But there's always a first time for everything, right? Whether the fan reaction to season two is one of rancor or indifference is probably my sole curiosity. Best guess, it'll be indifference, but we shall see. For those that love The Lord of the Rings, obviously my prescription is Peter Jackson's original trilogy. For those trying in vain to get some value from Amazon Prime streaming service, my prescription is the PBS Masterpiece Theater detective show Endeavor. The villain doesn't always have to be the white male every single time, so the mystery isn't solvable within five seconds of the opening credits, which is refreshing. And for those that like the Rings of Power, a kaleidoscope. I don't think them people need much besides some shapes and colors shifting around in a box to be pretty well contented. Anyway, I'm Dr. Balthazar. Like what you like, don't what you don't. It's all your call, Kimasabi. Take it easy, everyone.